to actually address all of these things, uh, to genuinely implement the maintenance approach. So I've got this same list on the left here, in a very different order, um, of types of damage. And on the right, I've got essentially the names of the ways in which I think that we have a very good fighting chance of going about stopping these things indefinitely from actually causing this problem. And I don't think, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that we will implement these things on the right to perfection in the next 20 or 30 years. But I do think that within that time, we have a fighting chance, I'd say at least a 50 50 chance, of implementing them to a degree of comprehensiveness that will suffice to achieve this goal at the top 30 years of extra healthy life. And of course, the big deal here, in terms of extrapolating that into the future, into the longer term future, is that these 30 years of extra healthy life will not be 30 years conferred on people who had just been born or had not even been conceived at the time that the therapies came along. There will be 30 years of extra life that will benefit people who are already in middle age at the time. In other words, who have already accumulated a respectable amount of damage, just in the same way that you don't take your car in for a comprehensive repair job the day after you've bought it with a new car. Similarly, these therapies will not be things that one will apply to young people, they will, apply, they will be applied to people 40 or 50 years and up. So that is essentially why we will be effectively buying time using this approach. Now, as I mentioned, I haven't got remotely enough time to go into any real detail on this. I will have, however, <coughs> give you a feel for the amount of detail. I had a book came out last year called Ending Aging, which was mentioned in the introduction, and uh, in which there is an entire chapter uh, um, dedicated to each of these things. So I could definitely stand up here for a good day without stopping, um, without having any difficulty in telling you more and more about how we're going about this sort of thing. And of course that's very important because the more detail one actually has in terms of the technological approach that one intends to take to solve a particular problem, the more confident one is entitled to be about the time frame that one estimates. So that's pretty good news. But in order to convince you that I'm not completely bullshitting you, I will go into a bit more detail on one of these approaches which is this one here. Um, I told you about the accumulation of molecules inside the cell that the cell doesn't know how to break down. Now, um, that turned out to be an extremely important problem in the aging process, and that's why I'm going to talk about it a bit. Um, this is the sort of thing that problem causes. This is a <coughs> micrograph section through the axon of a neuron in Alzheimer's brain, and as you can see, it's not very happy. There are lots of uh, things here that ought to be history. They ought to have been broken down some time ago, and they have not been. You can see these crazy multi-lamella structures which indicate basically autophagy going, happening and then not proceeding, and essentially serial autophagy happening. On the right here, a couple of other immuno EM photographs um, showing various enzymes that should be breaking things down and are not doing so. It's really not very nice at all. In the artery, you get this sort of thing, which is caused by completely different compounds. Of course, the things that accumulate in the Alzheimer's brain tend to be proteinaceous. In the artery, what you call lipid, especially cholesterol. And this is caused by derivatives of cholesterol, oxidation derivatives in particular, which accumulate gradually in the lysosomes of arterial macrophages that have invaded the artery, artery wall in order to clean that up, and which eventually turn those macrophages into sort of undead macrophages called foam cells, <coughs> um, which are the first histologically identifiable uh, um, uh, stage of atherosclerosis. And as we all know, atherosclerosis leads to heart attacks and strokes, which are two of the three top killers in the Western world. So this is something that we'd really rather fix. Now, um, I happen to know, as Heinz Wolf said earlier, that um, there's some other work going on in biology that might be relevant to this. And this particular work is not something that has ever been applied biomedically at all. It's been applied to a completely different area of biology, namely environmental decontamination. Bioremediation was born about 55 years ago with the idea, which its founder gave a wonderful name, the microbial infallibility hypothesis, of the idea that microbes are very clever. And in particular, that there are going to be microbes out there that can metabolize, that can, that can destroy more or less any compound that is organic and abundant in some environment or other and energy rich. In other words, if the bacterium can break it down, then it can live off it. Now, 
what the, this guy in question, his name was Ed Gale, what he um, realized was that a lot of molecules of that nature are quite hard to break down, intrinsically quite hard to break down, which means that some bacteria will be able to do it and, and most will not. And this will provide, if one just thinks about the evolutionary biology of it, this will provide selective pressure for a great deal of diversity in the microbial ecology of any given environment in terms of what the bacteria can break down. So he said, well, okay, supposing you've got a disused airfield and it's got like TNT in the soil or something like that, and it's, um, and you want, to, you want to build a housing estate on it, then what do you do? You build the TNT. The answer is you just go and look for the bacteria in the soil, and you will almost certainly find that some of them can break down TNT and are happily doing so. And the only reason there's any TNT left is because there are not enough of those bacteria. So you get them out, you expand them up in the laboratory, you put them back in your TNT, goes away, and you can build your housing. Lovely. So what I realized was that it might be possible to actually apply this biomedically because there are environments that are enriched in human remains. And these environments seem to bear out the microbial infallibility hypothesis rather well because, of course, they do accumulate certain components of the human body, but not the ones that are energy rich. The ones that they accumulate are bones and teeth, basically, which don't do a bacterium a lot of good if it breaks them down. Um, so what they do not accumulate is the compounds of interest to biogerontologists, the ones I just told you about. And so I reasoned that maybe what's going on here is that there are microbes that are successfully breaking these things down. Now I'm not suggesting that we should identify these microbes and then inject large numbers of them into our bodies. That would probably be counterproductive. But what we might very well be able to do is identify the genetic basis of how they get to be able to do this and alter our own cells accordingly and thereby augment our catabolic um, arsenal, our ability to break things down ourselves. Uh, so this is basically the idea of this natural process in the human body that turns young people into old people and eventually into dead people. And, um, and then there's a completely different process encoded in the microbial ecology that turns dead people into decomposed people. And the idea is simply to identify what that process is and do basically standard molecular biology and augment our own cells. This is my terrible cartoon of a neuron thereby um, combating the initial process that turned young people into old people in the first place. And it turns out to work. This is, a, um, this is, a, this is some results from an experiment that was done in our in-house laboratory. It was published last year. I've got a whole lot more papers coming out at the moment. Um, and what's going on here is an experiment to identify bacteria that can break down 7-keto cholesterol, which is public enemy number one in atherosclerosis. It's the most abundant and one of the most toxic of the oxidation derivatives of cholesterol, and it um, turns out not to be terribly hard to break down. What we've got here is a whole bunch of bacterial strains being given this stuff and being given nothing else to 